on here, but Brian, why don't you hit record? It's six o'clock. Let's get this show rolling. We're recording. Okay. Good evening, Doors Glen and Felton community. Um, due to the current federal and state emergency emergency declarations, the Minnesota directive to residents to stay at home and guidance about limiting person to person contact due to the COVID-19 Corona um, pandemic, this meeting of the Dilworth, Glen and Felton School Board is being conducted in accordance with Minnesota statutes 13D021, meetings by telephone or other electronic means. Due to the health pandemic, the school board determined that it is not feasible for at least one board member or the superintendent to be physically present at the regular meeting location and that it is not feasible for the public to attend this meeting at the regular meeting location due to this health pandemic. School board members are reminded to mute their microphones or phone when they are not speaking. School board members wishing to speak should um, use the little button on the left hand side and do the hand signal so I know that you would like to be addressed, please. Um, I will determine the order in which board members wishing to speak will be recognized. When recognized, the board members should unmute their microphone or phone, speak, and then mute their device. All votes will be conducted by a roll call, so our clerk Amy is able to um, record them. So each school board member should wait their name till their name is called before voting. Um, this meeting is being recorded, and access to this recording will be made available on the school district's website as soon as reasonably possible. So thank you for all being here. We'll forego the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, roll call. We have all board members present. Amy, David, Laura, Raleigh, Ronnie, and Sandy, and myself. And joining us are Principal uh, Lepard, Tracy Tollefson with Community Ed, uh, Marianne Martin with Special Ed, Margot Hilla, Principal of Glendon Elementary, John Jacobson, our Tech Director, and our superintendent, um, Mr. Brian Tigerson. All right, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Uh, was that Sandy? Sorry, I can't see anybody's face tonight. Oh, that was Laura. All right, Laura made a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Oh, second. Uh, second, I got by Ronnie. All right, we'll do a roll call for Amy. Amy? Aye. Sandy? Aye. Laura? Aye. David? Aye. Ronnie? Aye. Raleigh? Aye. Myself? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Um, public comments and rebel recognition. I'm going to go ahead and start. We have um, about 23 comments to read tonight, so I'm just going to systematically read one by one. Um, I did ask the clerk, Amy, to not time me, I don't think any of them over a couple minutes here. So uh, I apologize to all in advance if I butcher anybody's name um, that has submitted. So um, we're gonna start out with a parent, Mitch Fortier. Um, he said, dear school board members, I'm asking you to consider having graduation before June 9th of 2020. My son and others will not be here the end of June. They have taken an oath to defend your freedom, the very thing to do you do day to day is owed to children like mine and many others who are willing to die for their country and America's free will. I've been very proud to have my son be a part of DGF from kindergarten to senior. On many, many occasions, we have recognized members of the military, family of, member, family of members, and the fallen. Recited the Pledge of Allegiance and sang the Star Spangled Banner before many school events. The patriotism and military appreciation at DGF has been stellar. Please don't let this opportunity to keep this great school tradition slip away. I will also add that if it's okay for people to go into bars and restaurants and big box stores, it would be safe enough to have graduation on our football field with everyone practicing safe social distancing and proper PPE. Thank you for your comment. Now we move on to Gina Mastin. Will you please reconsider moving the principals around for the 2020-2021 school year? I think we can all agree that after the chaos of this year, our kids are going to need as much normalcy and familiar faces as possible. Thank you. Um, Eric and Rebecca Wilkie. We would like to strongly encourage the school board to leave the administrators at the current schools for the 2020-2021 school year. It has been said that the principals will be shifted around beginning in the fall. 
This would be such a sad situation for our students. When they return to the school, they will yearn for normalcy and routine. Having familiar faces at each school will be so incredibly important. If the administration needs to be moved around, this would not be the year it should happen. For the students, please keep this in mind. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. All right, Amanda Brooks. I am concerned for our children. I know it has been discussed to change the principles this school year, but with COVID-19 and the school year not ending like it normally would, I strongly believe that principles should remain in the same until our schools combine. At least give our kids a good start to the school year with the principal they have known and loved and trust and respect to start a new year after all this trauma caused by COVID-19. Please consider keeping site principles as it is for the upcoming school year. I strongly believe that this will benefit our children deeply as an educator and a mother of a student. A slow transition like a meet and greet with students when a principal will change will benefit all as well. Thank you much, so much for reading this. Thank you, Amanda. Sorry, all I need just a quick, quick swig away at water here. Um, all right, uh, Ian Nash. It is not fair for our class to take away what we have worked for for 12 years. My classmates and I worked too hard to be denied our chance to be heard and our chance at a proper send off like everyone else has before us. Let the student body decide or at least give us the chance to have one down the road. For me, I could care less if it's in August like prom. At least we would have one. Please put yourself in the kids' shoes how you would feel after you showed the commitment, put in the time, and gave full focus to school just to have your graduation lost forever. Thank you, Ian. Um, Keaton Ring, do a normal ceremony on the same day, but don't affiliate with the school. Thank you, Keaton. Um, Eli Kuchni, uh, I think the board should send out a survey to the students to see what we think about graduation. Thank you, Eli. Molly Holty, uh, please consider sending out a survey to seniors that allow us to have a say in, in our unusual graduation. Thank you, Molly. Um, Jacob Strand, uh, football field, no parade. Thank you, Jacob. All right, one sheet down, two to go, guys. Um, Logan Tucker, uh, give seniors the choice how we have graduation. Thank you, Logan. Uh, Jay Gruel, I think it is unfair to decide our fate for graduation without at least asking the entire student body. We went to school for most of our lives, always waiting for our big day to walk across the stage. We deserve to at least have our voices be heard. Things may not change if graduation is moved back to a later date. However, if it is set to the 31st and Governor Walsh changes his mind, you have just robbed a large amount of students of their big day. I strongly believe that we, the students, should have at least our opinions heard. Put yourself in our shoes or think if this were to have happened to your children. How would you want this situation to be handled by the student uh, it was happening to? Or would you rather have it handled by another group of individuals without any input by the student themselves? Please send out a survey and find out what the students want for themselves. Thank you, Jay. Um, Olivia Holm, um, I think we should have a semi-normal graduation. We worked our whole lives to get it to this point. It would be a shame if we had to graduate from a car. Thank you, Olivia. Howie Briss, um, have a drive by on Park Avenue to pick up their diploma and have it live streamed. Thank you, Howie. Uh, Alyssa Camacho, I understand these circumstances, but we've been waiting to walk across the stage for 12 years. Without having graduation, it'll be hard to move on to the next chapter of our lives without closure. Even if we were to have a parade now, but have the traditional graduation in December, that'd be better than skipping. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, Gracie Ahrens, a graduation ceremony should be held outside, welcoming only immediate family members and upholding social distancing guidelines. If chairs need to be placed further apart or sectioned off by families, then so be it. To miss such a monumental moment in our lives would be devastating. For many, this may be their only graduation ceremony, a family's first or a last child, or just a very difficult achievement for some. But for all, having graduation ceremony is a reward of the 12 years of hard work and dedication to our students, our studies, excuse me. A virtual graduation we, would not be acceptable. DGF is not a big city school with 2,200 graduates. We're a rural, with, rural school with 97 graduates. To compare DGF to St. Paul schools is like comparing a lake to an ocean, ocean just not great. Um, thank you, Gracie. Uh, Jocelyn Peterson. 
Uh, I all simply says I want a graduation. So thank you, Jocelyn. Dana, Jenny, it is it at least an option to do a drive-in type of graduation where we all stay in our cars and once each students need to get their diploma, we go one by one or a few at a time. Therefore, minimizes contact, allows immediate family to hold witness to the graduation and allows a real sense of closure for all of us students having to face the reality of our high school career coming to an end. If this is plausible, I believe it should be at least considered. Thank you. All right, gotta take a drink here, just a second. Uh, Taylor Ilg, our class has been looking forward to senior year our whole lives and to have it have part of it taken away really hurts. The last thing we would want is to have our graduation taken away too. All of us want to walk across the stage to receive our diploma and celebrate as a class together. Thank you, Taylor. Lydia Fortin, how can we make it as special as possible and memorable for me as a senior? I want to experience this with my other classmates. Since we didn't get to finish out our year together, I want to say goodbye and have closure with all my classmates, more than just seeing them online. Also, I want letters from the teachers and the teachers' involvement in the ceremony like we would normally have. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, Kayla Fisher, I would like to ask for more information on why is there on why there is a plan change for the school's principals in the 2020-2021 school year with the recent COVID-19 crisis. If and when a if and when children come back in the fall. Um, Sorry, I'm losing my eyesight. There is no doubt it will look different. I would request that the school board review and put together a plan to keep the current principles constant for our children next year. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, last page all. Um, Jennifer Jenny, is a drive-in ceremony a possibility? One car, family, and only graduate gets out to receive diploma and live stream as well. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Jessica Hooper, um, at the end of this year, I'll be leaving DGF to take a job at Cheyenne High School in West Fargo. This is an incredibly difficult decision for me, mostly because of the relationships I have built with my students and coworkers. DGF has supported all of my projects with students, and I feel like I have built a program I am very proud of. My coworkers and principal have been incredible, incredible mentors and supporters of my work, and I value them greatly. Given all these positive aspects of DGF Public Schools, I wanted to explain my reasoning for leaving. The experiences we have had during this year's contract negotiations have been draining and put a lot of stress on all of us educators. We have felt devalued and disrespected at times. However, we've also come together stronger as a team. I made, it, I made up my mind to apply for the West Fargo position the night the board rescinded its offer to us shortly after the schools closed. The offer we received and voted on was too little too late, and I had already accepted the new position. We warned the prolonged negotiations and not offering teachers an equitable deal would result in the district losing its best and brightest. Not to sound vain, but I think you are losing one of those teachers with me leaving. Difficult decisions can bring about growth, and I hope that DGF can grow and make some positive changes in the future to support their teachers. I will miss my DGF family greatly and are rooting for their, their success. All right, that is it. Does anybody have any rebel recognition they would like to share? All right, seeing no hands raised, um, let's move on to reports. 6.1, special education report. Marianne, the floor is yours. Okay. Um did you guys all receive a copy of, I shared it in a Google Doc with everyone last week? Okay. Um, I'll just go, I'll just kind of hit on some of this. If you guys have any questions, let me know. But Amy, Amy had her hand raised <laughs> for a while now. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't see everybody. No, that's okay. I was just going to say, can you send me um, a list of the people who did public comments so I can put it in the notes? That was it. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Yep, I'm sorry. I'm. It's, someone might have to speak up since I'm presenting. Just so everybody's aware, I can't. I thought I would be able to see. I can speak up, Lindsay. If I see a hand raise, I can. Oh, let that'd you know. be that'd be wonderful. Thank you, Marianne. Yep. 
Um, I just want to let everyone know that the special ed teachers, I mean, and you guys know this, everyone's been working very hard with distance learning and the special education team has as well. Um, they continue to work hard to provide the equitable learning for all students that are receiving special education. Um, also, special education teachers, during the time of distance learning, they're also required to still do IEPs and do the evals that they can. Um, any evals that require face-to-face -face testing time, we've, um, through guidance through MDE, we've had to put those um, evaluations on hold until we're back at school. But any other evals that, like three-year re-evals, that can be done through gathering data um, with testing scores or gathering information from parents, um, even observations through Google Meets, those evaluations were still required to meet the timelines and were also required to meet the timelines on all of our IEPs um, through Google Meets or phone conferences, whatever works for parents. So teachers have been working really hard with that as well. Um, out of the 51 paras, we have 38 paras that have been working on distance learning with 38 paras that are involved in distance learning with students. We have some paras who are completely just doing distance learning. Um, I know we have some at the high school and middle school that have been working so hard with the students to make sure that if those students have any questions or concerns about classes, um, they are able to check in with those paras. Um, they, it's kind of like a homework help or assistance time, and they can log into that Google Meets at any time to get a, um, during the day to get assistance from a paraprofessional. And I think that's been really really helpful for students. Um, also, we have some para professionals who are doing distance learning and also childcare. And then we have some paras who are just doing childcare or assisting with um, the food distribution at the school. Um, but just wanted to make note that the paraprofessionals have played an essential role during this time as well, and we're thankful for them. Um, I've been meeting on a weekly basis with our Region 4 special education directors, and we've been meeting with Zoom meetings, and that's set up with Jill Scarvold out of Lakes Country Service Co-op, and that's been really helpful just to get other people's input, and we share MDE updates, so that's been really nice to do that each week. Um, as of right now, and this has even changed since I wrote this last week, um, the extended school year for special education um, through the governor's guidance and MDE, we're looking at doing distance learning with ESY through June. And now it looks like we'll be doing distance learning um, through August for our ESY services. And I have a meeting with the ESY teachers tomorrow to discuss that. So we'll just continue with distance learning, not bringing those students into the building. And so that would be, obviously we do our um, birth to three services. Um, our early childhood special ed teacher will continue to provide those services through distance learning over the summer. And then our birth or our three-year-old to five-year-old programs, they'll do distance learning. And then our school age ESY We'll have a teacher provide distance learning with that as well. Um, let's see, programming for next year. Um, I met with the special education staff through a Google Meets on May 1st, and we went over staffing for next year and how that's going to look. We had a few changes and we've had movement where people are going to be. Um, and then, and I did give a list of where people will be. I won't read all of that. Um, as of right now, I still have two special education teachers to hire. One is at the Glendon Felton Elementary, and then one is at the high school. And then we also have one speech language pathologist to hire. And um, there'll probably be about eight to 10 paraprofessional positions to hire um, at some point for next school year. Um, once we're back from distance learning, we'll need to have those people hired. And those would be people kind of, you know, our natural loss of paraprofessionals, they leave for different reasons at the end of a school year. So just to replace those paraprofessionals are the ones that I'd be hiring for. So that's the information that I have right now. Um, we'll just continue to look for applications. Um, uh, I've 
I, as of right now, I don't have any applications coming in. I'd like to see those coming in. So if you guys know any special ed teachers or speech teachers, send them our way. Um, but otherwise, I was able to find another interpreter, um, a ASL interpreter. So I was happy about that. Um, and then with Betty Benson returning for speech, um, that will help us out as well. So anybody have any questions for Marianne just speak freely because I can't see anybody's hand raised or raise it and she'll call you <laughs> any questions nope all right let's move on to 6.2 federal programs uh, report Brian can you share with us who's going to be giving that report please so part of it is just finding out who all is on uh, to put this in perspective and one of the reasons we added this is so that you know the board members and and the public under, understands how much this has changed over the years we now have you know title funds is something that has always been federal that most school districts every you know people get title funds title one title two um but at dgf now we also have american indian funds that are federal we have achievement integration funds and so what we end up doing you know is we end up having administrators that are all taking on some of these different tasks to work with this and, and trying to get the parameters set up so that we can look at how do we maximize these funds um, to be able to provide the best intervention services for students. And uh, is, is Margo, um, I didn't, Margo is, is, is in charge of a lot of our federal funds uh, that are not special ed. Of course, Marianne is, uh, you know, does all of our federal with special ed. And then Margo does everything that is uh, associated with title funds and also the achievement and integration. Uh, Wayne does all of the reporting associated with the American Indian. So I'm asking uh, either both uh, if they would just give some comments on uh, the status of these uh, these funds. Hi, hi guys. This is Margo. Um, we just got notification um, regarding our achievement and integration funding um, that's been approved now for the second year. So we heard from MDE on that um, title. I haven't heard any numbers to begin um, to, to begin working yet. Um, but I will, I think they usually come in, our grant money starts coming in June 1st. Um, we'll, we'll figure out how many or how much money we get. And then I will write the grant as to how to um, move forward with that programming. Last year, it was $139,000 we got. Um, I don't foresee it growing any because of the trend shows it's going down. Um, actually, about $5,000 a year from the from when I started. Um, but hopefully, hopefully we'll be still around that 139. Um, and I will begin that um, title application when it is um, what MDE is ready for it. Margo, would, would you would you tell Tell the board members, to, uh, tell people in general, what do we use those funds for? The title, the title funds? Correct, correct. Or the, uh, yep, the title funds are used to um, fund intervention services. So, you know, we're really, we're, we really use those um, funds for, for um, adults, for grownups to aid our students in, um, in making gains. So that's what the title, and then the achievement and integration piece, those funds are used for um, some of the AVID programming, some of the professional development programming, um, and uh, some other of the intervention needs that we have during the school year. Thanks, Margo. And, and again, we, and we, and we've talked about this, I think at previous board meetings, but these are the examples, when you hear the amount of money coming in, to provide those intervention services. And then you look at the model that we've been utilizing for a number of years using certified staff for that. And, and so when I brought up before that, we run anywhere from 300 to $400,000 in expenses in those programs, but we only have a hundred and some thousand dollars of revenue coming in. Um, it's one of the reasons that we've talked for at least two years about that we have to change that model because so many of the other districts will utilize one or two people at most 
certified staff, and then train paraprofessionals uh, to work one-on-one -on -one with a lot of the students. In the same way that we do with uh, special ed services, we have one-to-one -one paras constantly. So that model is a change that we are transitioning as uh, we're putting things together over the next couple of years. And of course, the, the uh, achievement integration is, is really one of those very new ones. And that is all based on if you happen to be located in a region that you have uh, a disparity between uh, different demographic groups. And because we're a border community to Moorhead, which has a, uh, a, a much higher American Indian population, that creates where that's the, the key in for us with both the American Indian and the achievement integration. And I see Wayne's on, so, you know, anything you can add to that, Wayne? Yeah, so the application we got about $27,000, and it's K through, you can use it for preschool, but I essentially wrote it for uh, K through 12, and there's different components for each grade level. But uh, a big component with the committee, the parent group wanted, was looking for a couple things, and then the application asked for the same things as college readiness. Um, in order to do that, lots of tutoring um, and looking at that, we were looking at having, I know Katie's been starting to do some tutoring, having some tutoring ideas with the high school kids <clears throat> with each other as peers and with the younger kids. And so I think we'll, we're going to plan on putting something together or that would combine the two. And so that uh, Native American kids would be having tutoring opportunities as well with uh, the gen ed students. Um, and then uh, K through eight, each site would be getting uh, a book library, which is something they were promoting for us uh, at MDE to have I, up to about $3,000 a piece per site, K through eight, uh, whether they're authors of American Indian books or if it's more of a cultural type of thing. Um, college visits, Morris is a, is a site University of Minnesota Morris is a site where they have uh, uh, programming uh, for American Indian students and promotions. And so uh, part of that would be for site visits for uh, our students and families to go there for college preparations. Um, and then some site lyceums. Uh, Monoman has a few things that we can look at, tap into. Detroit Lakes does. And... Uh, and then at the high school, we're looking at ways that we can close achievement gaps for those students as well. And that should be it, Lindsay. Okay, wonderful. Thank you all. Um, Brian, do you have anything to add? You're good? We're good. Okay. All right. Anybody have any questions for the three of them? If so, I can't see anybody, so Brian will address you. We're good? Okay, let's move on to 6.3 technology report. Um, it's all yours, John. Okay, just a uh, couple of quick operational items. Uh, first one really pertains to some of the things we got planned for getting the devices back uh, with this distance learning. Uh, long story short, been working with the admin team and an IT team. And essentially we are gonna be collecting student devices May 26th and May 27th. We'll do one day with the elementary, the other day with the high school. Uh, our game plan is to have devices and school property kind of return from 7.30 in the morning to approximately seven o'clock at night. Parents and students will be able to bring their devices back to their, their child's school. We'll also have carts uh, ready for quick inventory identification of the device. We'll put them in the, the appropriate cart and at a bare minimum, we'll be having those devices essentially quarantined for two weeks before we can start repairing inventory, doing any work that, you know, that needs to be done. Um, our game plan is to work with students or families on an individual basis. If they need that device over the summer to help continue their their education process. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna be supportive on that front, but we do want to collect the devices back to make sure we got them 
in working operational order, not only for the summer, but really starting off the school year in the fall that we got everything that needs to, to make sure it's ready to go. A um, couple other items pertaining to maybe, you know, some, some up and coming capital outlay requests. Uh, we were due to replace or upgrade our wireless system. And we had budgeted approximately about 150,000, you know, for, for that particular project, but prices came in super aggressive this winter. Uh, and we got that probably forecasted for around 85,000. And this year is unique because with the federal E-rate money, we had some money left over from the previous years, but they extended it one more year and that's gonna end this year. So essentially 50% of that cost will be subsidized by federal E-rate money, which helps essentially financially support schools that are trying to bring internet or digital you know, content to, you know, to the students. Um, and then there's a few other capital labor, you know, projects, one pertaining to uh, student devices, uh, our, our, our own going, ongoing refresh of that equipment, and to start working on some of the employee refresh. We were going to do that last summer, but we delayed it uh, one more year. Uh, but we are going to look at possibly replacing some of the key equipment that we can do this summer, just so we don't have so many tech-related projects next summer tied to with the, the bond with the security cameras the classroom equipment you know stuff like that so it's kind of helping spread some of the costs over a few years but yet being realistic next summer is going to be really a busy summer so whatever we can chip away this summer is is uh definitely a huge time saver you know for us at the moment so that's all i had unless anyone had specific questions, thoughts, or concerns, I'll be happy to answer them. John, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, and I'm naive to this, so this might be a silly question, but um, so my third grader, he's going to be returning his stuff next week. So does he, does each student keep their same device or do you, or does it, do they get passed around to different kids depending upon, you know? No, the each student, when any student that brings back their device, they will get their device back. So, okay. so we know when we do our inventory, what device is assigned to each individual student. Uh, we do that for really just general good, you know, inventory records, but also accountability piece. We kind of tell the students, hey, this is your your device for the next while well, it's going on four years. So there's a little more ownership with the students, you know, okay. knowing that their device is going to follow them around for the next four years. So if they want to be hard on it, you know, they know they're going to get that same device back and not somebody else's. OK, thank you. You bet. Any other comments for John or questions? John, do you see anything? I don't see anything, so. I think we're good. Thank you. All right, I think I think we are good. Yes, thank you, appreciate you. Um, all right, 6.4 board committee reports. Has anybody had a meeting since we last had a board meeting last Monday? Speak freely, because I can't see you, or Brian will call upon you. All right, I think we're we're good. I will say shortly, we did have a, a quick meeting on Friday night after the governor um, released his statement regarding graduation. So we'll get further into that. Let's let Brian get going because we will be having discussion regarding that um, at the end. Um, so go ahead, uh, Brian, would you like me to stop presenting? Are you gonna be showing us anything? Yeah, I, I, I will, Lindsay, so. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead. Okay, let's, oh, here we go. Perfect. Okay, John taught me something today all, just so you know, I've learned something new skill. Oh, there we go. That's perfect. So a couple things I'll go through before we um, get into some of the presentation mode. Um, you may have seen that we put out the timelines regarding uh, capital outlay purchases and uh, for classroom requests, and then also on the classroom requisition orders. Uh, put some information out last night, including um, all of the POs associated with this year. Uh, what's really nice about the process through Region 1 
is that the teachers can simply pull up that purchase order and then they have the availability based on those handouts to be able to go in and, and directly see what supplies they ordered. They can actually copy it into this next year's requisition and save themselves a whole heck of a lot of time for the requisition. So the process with capital uh, outlay is, is we simply accumulate all of those capital outlay requests. We put them in our good old capital outlay general spreadsheet. And then we started having the meetings, uh, site team leadership, birth to five, six to 12, admin cabinet, and then get recommendations that we can bring forward to the board based on that. Um, for the people on operations, um, there's no point meeting yet tonight. We don't have any new updates yet. I, I'm thinking that it may be, um, it may make sense for us to look at meeting a week from tonight on, on the 18th. Uh, but I'll contact each of you as we get information. And the reason I say that is we've, we have a number of things that are happening this week. We know that we have the oversight committee meeting on Friday. We know that the governor is going to, or not the governor, but the commissioner um, is going to be giving an update to the soups uh, on Thursday at 4.30. And that specifically is about summer plans and extended uh, school year planning uh, and a little bit about calendar. Uh, so that's gonna be a pretty important one. And with that as information, I think we'll, we'll definitely have the basis of looking at an operations meeting sometime next week and then so that we can have the fiscal meeting uh, directly before the meeting on the 26th so that both of the committees have an opportunity to look at both from uh, the economic point of view for this and a needs assessment on operations. So that's all coming. Um, we've, we've got the uh, tentative plans with uh, the transportation vendors, of course, based on meetings we've had um, looking at pay rates on the spring extracurricular, of course, the regular routes proceeding with that, uh, spring coaches, compensation. Um, I will, once we get the contract, uh, you know, if that gets ratified tonight, then I'll reach out to uh, uh, the EM president and to Tony and, and just uh, relate to him, here's the plans on the compensation for the spring extracurricular. Uh, update land acquisition. Uh, that's been that's been taking some time because an abstract wasn't located. Uh, so we shared on Saturday actually. Uh, I shared with uh, Terry Setter uh, a copy of the purchase uh, agreement again. That's sitting with the attorneys. They're going to draw up everything for the deed so that we can get this transferred. We want to make sure that we have that done uh, by June 1st so that uh, on the tax rolls everything is is taken care of. Um, CARES Act, federal funding. Margo brought up about the uh, title money and there is an update that I've received regarding um, that money. Um, we know that the early indication is that the title one part A for DGF is gonna be 129,253. 129,253, Margo, just so you know. And the estimated CARES Act uh, subgrant, which is the federal money to come in to help offset the expenses associated with what we're having to do for distance learning and everything else about this chaotic spring, uh, that will be $107,340. So 107,000. And that can be either rolled over to the next year. Uh, we can look at it uh, for some of the uses if we have to do some summer planning, uh, some potential extended school year. Uh, like I said, there's a lot that we don't know yet regarding that because as you've all seen, you just look at the graduation information, these things have changed constantly. We also received the early indication on the new insurance rates. Uh, the insurance and from PEEP, uh, and we've, uh, they prefaced it based on the amount of people coming in 
to clinics and to hospitals associated with COVID-19. The rates are scheduled to go up anywhere from just under 10% for the Advantage plan all the way to about 12% for the third one. Um, so, you know, this is a kicker, and but I, I think it, it goes hand in hand stressing on why, and I'm just gonna show this very quickly um, so that you can see, there's the cost folks. So you can see, between single employee plus one family, this current rates and then next year's rates. And each one of these are done actuarially separately. That's why the rates, it's based on who's in what group and what those the profits and losses were for each of those particular groups. So it isn't a set straight 10% across the board. Every one of those plans have different rate increases. So again, that's not great news, but I think hand in hand, when you look at where a lot of the emphasis was on this collective bargaining agreement that is being uh, decided tonight, the importance of increasing the health insurance contributions, because these are some big numbers. This is the highest one since we've been on PEEP. And I'm sure it's across the board, doesn't matter who your carrier is we're going to see some ma massive changes with insurance. So I will, uh, Jeannie was sending out information on this today. I think she sent this out, but this is, uh, I want to make sure that at least everybody uh, has, has an opportunity to see that because it is, uh, those are big numbers. Uh, the next one that I just wanted to just review very quickly um, so the graduation plans, updates, uh, as, as was stated, we, we were meeting last Friday. This was all very much news to everybody. Um, and the one I wanted everybody to see now, this is the basis of why the changes have to happen with graduation. And I've highlighted a couple of absolute critical pieces on what is driving this, why we can't do, whether it's in the building, whether it's out in the football field. If you look at the highlighted part, and I'm just gonna read it because some people may not be able to read it. We know that many schools have considered ceremonies outside in stadiums or football fields. In-person social gatherings with people from multiple households, even in situations where ample space between attendees could be accommodated, does not comply with social distancing practices and introduces a great deal of contact, unpredictability, and increases the potential for disease transmission. These gatherings are not considered safe at any size and will not be permitted. Likewise, indoor graduations, commencement ceremonies, will also not be permitted. That's what we're under. And as I discussed on Friday, part of the, the problem, it doesn't matter where you, it doesn't matter if you go out of state, it doesn't matter if you go to North Dakota, go across the board, it's still a school sponsored graduate, it's, it's DGF graduation ceremony. We're sponsoring it, which means it's under the umbrella of the school district's insurance. This is stating very specifically that that will not be covered. This is the basis of that. So this isn't about good idea, bad idea. These are simply our parameters. It's like going down the highway, nobody's around and somebody says, why can't you drive 75 miles an hour? Doesn't matter. These are the rules we gotta work with them. So um, we will put this out to the public. I think this three page document is something well worth everybody being able to see. Um, there have been plans and these will continue to be developed. 
uh, updates from Friday that I can tell everybody. We know for a fact uh, with the idea of a parade, we have absolute, uh, I would say, excitement and extreme positive feedback. Um, I know Jake has been in conversation with, uh, with our county sheriff, with Mark, uh, and Tracy's been in contact with uh, personnel from the city of Glendon. I met uh, with, uh, I've been in communication with the mayor of Dilworth, and today I met with uh, the city, uh, uh, Peyton Mastera for the city of Dilworth. Peyton even put together a potential map of what it could look like in the city limits of Dilworth. And again, this is all gonna be put together. Um, this is just a work in progress right now. Remember that we're still working through this. We've been in contact, uh, the, the city of Felton is um, going to have their emergency. They're gonna have fire trucks involved in this process. So we truly have each of the municipalities, each of the cities, the county, everybody helping to create a very unique potential graduation experience for these, for these, uh, for these great kids. Um, it's within the parameters. We, we have, we're restricted to certain things, but we can make this be a one of a kind unique experience for our graduates. So um, again, my hope would be that we put a route together all the way coming from the high school uh, through, um, you know, coming on the north side through the county. And then we get into Dilworth and we go all the way through the city of Dilworth and also give people that opportunity to help celebrate with our graduates and have this put out the whole map put out in an, uh, a letter that goes out to every taxpayers in the district, including that letter from the commissioner showing what we're working within for parameters. So that's the plan right now. And again, what the board has to do is simply make that decision on whether you're going to move the date to the 31st. A uh, couple other things, and then I'll take whatever questions. Um, there's Again, I, I said we got the update coming on Thursday with uh, the commissioner. Um, we had a dis we've had a couple of discussions today as an admin cabinet. Um, one regarding how do we go through, when do we make decisions on hiring? In particular, the hiring that we typically need to do every year with our paraprofessionals. Um, that will probably, and I, I know, uh, Marianne brought up about what she was hearing in her regional meeting. What I am hearing very consistent from everyone is that school districts are gonna wait until August to do that hiring. Why? Because you don't know how you're gonna start out the year. We don't know at this time whether it will be all the students back in the buildings or if we'll be doing distance learning. And with that in being the case, that changes our parameters on how we start out the year with uh, the amount of paraprofessionals that we will have staffed working right away. So there's a lot of things that are out of our control. Um, that's what the spring has been. We keep monitoring, we keep adjusting. Uh, the second item that goes hand in hand with some of the, uh, uh, the comments uh, through uh, uh, at the beginning of the meeting, and I and I thought those were uh, there were some very constructive uh, feedback comments from people. Um, interesting timing because administratively we probably spent um, a good 30, 45 minutes this afternoon just having the discussion about the principal placement and what started uh, the look at the movement, the transition plans for this fall. Remember, all of this went into effect. We we're looking at doing that uh, prior to COVID-19. And with the idea that, and it came uh, consensus from each of the building principals, that it would be critical for them to start building the relationships with those staff members to give them that time to do that, knowing 
where they were going to be at in the fall of 21. Our world's changed. And so that's why we we are in the middle of discussions about because of the importance of the relationships with the students, helping the students through the summer, trying to figure out what students may need a jumpstart programming, um, help make sure that they're ready for the fall. That is pretty difficult to ask a new building principal to come in for that. So there is going to be a recommendation over the next the course of the next week, definitely before staff leave for the summer, as far as whether or not we will keep all four of the principals exactly where they're at. Um, and I, I think it's it's extremely legitimate concern because of how critical the relationships that have been built with students and with staff over the course of this time with these principals. And I, and I, I think they've done a great job bringing leadership teams together. So this is an example of how things change based on the conditions. So we'll, we'll have more on that to report back to the board. Uh, we wanna have some more of those discussions over the course of the next week. And we'll have some updates on, on that placement. So there is nothing set in stone, just like graduation. Um, and I think I just have one more, um, nope, that does it for mine. So I'm ready for any questions. Uh, no, I take that back. I wanted to show the calendar very quickly. Um, so hopefully I can remember, I have so many things up right now. Um, I'm titled got that one. Otherwise I'll wait until we get to the calendar. Lindsay, I'll wait until we get to the calendar one, and then I'll bring it up so we can okay. talk about that at that time. So I'll quit presenting at this point. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. We're moving on to 7.1, um, approval of the minutes. David raised his hand. So oh. I have a few oh, David. Hands. Welcome. We welcome your comments. Go ahead. <laughs> Brian, I just had a question on the health insurance. Have we um, gone to the market? For that, have we marketed our insurance program recently, or do we have the opportunity to do that, or how does that work? We, we, we do, we do what. Um, however, the teachers' union itself mm -hmm. has the right to select what health insurance. So, potentially, you could have two different health insurance plans going on in a district because we can't control the largest group okay. that we choose. And David, to be honest, far and away, if you look at the rates and, and, and you'll, you'll see some documents coming, uh, PEEP has been the most competitive far and away. Um, the, when we switched out of our group, Lakes Country group, um, and what was always nice about being in one of those groups is you had that stop gap that was built in for those catastrophes. And if you're out on your own, unless you, you know, you're gonna try that self-insured, you're gonna have a problem. Um, so PEEP is just such a larger group because it's statewide that it provides much more stability than anything else we typically can get. I have uh, I have colleagues and and I I just have I have so many memories over the years being on the insurance you know the regional committee for a, quite a few years in my role as principal and and superintendent and I've seen districts uh, take thirty some percent increases and you know you you think about what that does to your budget because yeah. in some cases some of those school districts had set percents that the district was required to pay. Yeah, that's brutal. So they shared in it, yes. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Yep. Any other questions for Brian? All right, seeing none, we're going to move on to 7.1, um, approval of the April 27th uh, meeting. Can I have a motion, please? So, so move. Oh, oh, my goodness. I think David got David. it. All right, uh, Amy, you want a second then? I'll second. All right. 
All right. So we got a motion by David, a second by Amy. Roll call. Um, Laura. Hi. Sandy. Hi. Amy. Hi. David. Hi. Raleigh. Hi. Ronnie. Hi. Myself. Hi. Motion carries. All right, now we'll move on to 7.2, special meeting, May 4th. This is to prove those approval of those minutes. Uh, can I have a motion, please? So moved. So moved by Raleigh. Um, can I have a second? I'll second. Second by Sandy. All right, roll call vote here. Laura? Aye. Amy? Aye. Sandy? Aye. David? Aye. Raleigh? Aye. Ronnie? Aye. Myself, aye. Our motion carries 7 0. Consent agenda. Raleigh, what are claims and accounts? Uh, $63,003.96. Okay. We're also improving the resignation of Cor um, Corinne Moorcastle. She is a paraprofessional. This is effective at the end of the 2019 20 school year and approve the re res resignation of Jessica Hopper, middle school art, effective the end of the 2019-2020 school year. Um, thank you to both of them for their work at our school district, and we wish them luck. Um, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Uh, uh, moved by Raleigh. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, Laura, you got that one. Um, all right, roll call. Amy. Aye. Sandy. Aye. Laura? Aye. Ronnie? Aye. David? Aye. Raleigh? Aye. Myself? Aye. Motion carries. All right. We have a 9.1. We have a confidential contract um, for Sally Lundy, sign language interpreter, language facilitator at 29.87 an hour, effective the start of 2020-2021. Just to clarify, this is just a category that Brian puts us under. Um, uh, that's why it's listed as confidential. Um, can I have a motion to approve? So moved. So moved by Sandy. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Ronnie. All right. Amy, we'll do a roll call here. Amy? Aye. Laura? Aye. Ronnie? Aye. Sandy? Aye. David? Aye. Raleigh? Aye. Myself, aye. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, 9.2, certified contract. Um, this is for Kaylee Goda. She will be the middle school art teacher, BA Step 1, effective the start of the 2020 2021 school year. Do I have a motion? So moved. Uh, motion by Amy. Is there a second? Second. Second by David. All right, we'll do a roll call. I'm going to go reverse. Raleigh? Aye. David. Aye. Sandy. Aye. I have a question too. Oh, I'm sorry. I totally forgot discussion. Go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering, was she one of Jacia's uh, student teachers? Yep. Okay. Amy's yep. nodding her head. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Totally forgot about discussion. Yeah. No, the kids <laughs> had her as a student teacher this last year and they enjoyed her. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that, Sandy. So Sandy's a yes, right? Okay, Ronnie. Aye. Laura? Aye. Amy? Aye. Myself, aye. Motion carries. Um, 9.3, this will be um, for the 2019, 2020, and 2021 master agreement between the uh, our school district, 2164, and EMDGF. Um, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. So moved by David. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Sandy. Any discussion? I would just like to thank our negotiating team for all of the hard work, uh, sweat, and some tears that you guys shed over this process. So, uh, Brian, David, Lindsay, and Sandy, thank you guys very much for supporting or um, being the board negotiators this year. I appreciate it. Thank you. I just had a quick question for Brian that we talked about eliminating that step one. Did we do that or what is the current step one? Uh, yes, Ronnie, we did. So what happened is 
it's the reason why everybody is able to get uh, a step movement each year. And basically, when you look at in the past, you know, one of the big advantages of the way that this was processed, uh, all of those people that were at that terminal step, adding the 1,000 and the 1,500 onto the previous step 18 made a new step 18 and allowed us to remove step one. So we were able to just move everything one. Thank you. Any other questions? I can say for the negotiating team, um, leadership is hard and I appreciate their leadership um, and uh, working through this. And thank you, Brian, for helping us get this done. So I'm happy to accept this motion in the second and uh, here we go, roll call, Amy. Oh wait, time out, who made a motion? Oh no, I uh, got it, never mind, you're good. David and Sandy. <laughs> Aye. You're good? Aye. Okay. Good. Yeah. Sorry. That's Aye. okay. Ronnie. Aye. Sandy. Aye. David. Aye. Raleigh. Oh. Aye. Raleigh, aye. Myself, aye. Uh, motion carries 7-0. Okay, so we have additional action items. 10.1 is our 2020-2021 Minnesota High School League resolution for membership. Um, Amy, you do not need to read this, per Brian. So Brian, speak now or hold we'll your piece about this. You said she didn't have to read it. Correct. Uh, everybody has seen the resolution? Yes. Okay, then I don't have to worry about reading over the screen and presenting. Awesome. Okay, so this is just something we annually do for membership, correct, Brian? Okay. Just to get the question out there. Absolutely. Okay, can I have a motion, please? So moved. So moved. Oh, I got David first. Raleigh, would you like to second that? Absolutely. All right, Raleigh is going to second it. Any further discussion? Yeah, Lindsay, I just had a question. Brian, you sent that thing, something about we're supposed to watch that video or something for it? But I couldn't figure out how to get into the video. It seemed to be joining a meet. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. either. It didn't work yeah, with me either. Okay. It was a Google meet. Did you read the resolution, Ronnie? Yeah, I did read the resolution, so I'm okay on that. I just was yep. I thought we had to go on and, you know, watch this video too, as far as part of it that we're supposed right. to do. But I, I will I will look and I'll I'll CC myself so that I can test to see if it's coming through on that. Um, it's the same, this isn't a new one, folks. So I think more than anything, it's just, as you have time, take a look at the video. It's just a good video on, you know, just again, why we do what we do with it, especially in these times. <laughs> it's interesting. Okay. So I'll right. reset it. Okay, thank you. So we have a, a motion by David, a second by Raleigh. Any further discussion? All right, roll call vote. Raleigh? Aye. Sandy? Aye. David? Aye. Amy? Aye. Laura? Aye. Ronnie? Aye. Myself, aye. Motion carries. All right, um, this is 10.2 is the 2020-2021 DGF school calendar. Brian is going to be presenting this. Can I get a motion? So moved. Uh, moved by Raleigh. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Sandy. Brian uh, is going to present so we can have some discussion. Thank you all. Oh, you're on mute, Brian. Yep, you're muted, Brian. How was that? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so again, this is going with uh, the idea of starting before Labor Day. Um, and those of you who have been involved with the Oversight Committee work, you, uh, you're you well aware of the importance of, being, of how busy summer of 21 is gonna be. It, it's gonna be extremely busy for them. We have the opportunity uh, to be able to start before Labor Day. 
Um, this is going to be, uh, it, we, we, by contract, we have to have the board approve an initial uh, calendar. And the initial calendar must be approved meeting the requirements uh, with students. We know um, after going through the amount of student contact days, uh, when you look at this instructional days piece, we need to have a minimum of 165 instructional days with students. So the other calendar option with an early start was not gonna meet that requirement. So the 164 could not work. This calendar is set up um, and I do anticipate that there will be some changes with the workshop days for staff because I think we have a unique opportunity to be able to look at it in multiple means. Um, I don't see the instructional days with students changing. Uh, you'll notice that this is set up so that there are three workshop days in August 24th through the 26th. Then the first two instructional days with students, uh, grades one through 12, are on the 27th and 28th of August. And the reason for that purple there is because that's the ready for K. What we typically do those first two days is not have the kindergartners in as a group, but one-to-one -one so that the staff members can get to know them and, and have those meetings. That's been very successful. Uh, it's uh, been very positive uh, feedback from the kindergarten uh, staff. So we would still have that on those two days. Um, this calendar would provide that we would have the students done by May 14th with graduation on the 16th. It allows us, notice we have these extra days, eight days that would be non-instructional. Now, the discussion we had today as an admin cabinet, and that is gonna be discussed uh, with leadership teams, is there's nothing that says that these eight days have to be in May at the end of the year. There may be an advantage, and some of the sites may choose that they actually want those days, maybe they start on the 17th of August, and they do some of those workshop days there. And the reason I say that is because right now we don't know how the fall is gonna start out, whether it's gonna be through distance learning or not. And if you think about how we went into distance learning, all of a sudden the state gave us a number of days for planning purposes to get ready for the distance learning. I would anticipate the same thing's gonna happen this fall. And we know that we have some students that may be getting incompletes. We know that we have some students that may need a jump start to get ready for the fall. This would allow, in particular, the high school and the middle school to be able to have, they're gonna put time in, we know that people are dedicated, but we could actually have them working with those students in from the 17th to the 21st, let's say. And again, it may be up to the sites, they may choose. So in the end, I, I fully anticipate a calendar that has these, these days in the lavender, whatever color you wanna call it, that are staff only. Uh, maybe there's eight days in August and then eight days in May. And we simply work in agreement with our staff that you're gonna be putting in eight of those days and you work it out with your principals, what makes the most sense for the elementary, the middle school and the high school. But again, tonight the importance is to get the calendar approved because it's really the student instructional days that we have to be able to get locked in for planning purposes. So if we're gonna start early, we have to start by August, at the very least, we'd have to start on the 28th, which doesn't make sense to start for one day. So if we have 27th and the 28th, that's giving us one grace day. So think about that when we talk about storms and what else not. But again, we have some worked in days that we could have school. 
if we so need. So there's options with this, whether it be in, in uh, April or whether it be in January or February. We have some days that if we need to make them student contact days, we can. But again, what I'm banking on also, I think we've got another advantage. If we have staff that are working with students the week before all of the kids are back, because if that is some of that distance learning, the planning time, think about what they did this year. They took those days in March, and even though those were planning dates, the state counted those as student instructional dates. So we were able to count those towards our 160 some days. So again, that's gonna give us some advantages. But we, you know, like I said, we're gonna work through this with our leadership teams, um, but this is what we need to have for student contact days just to be able to make the minimum requirements. And now I'll just take any questions. This came from the calendar committee, just so you know. All of the calendars came directly from those committees. Anybody have any questions for I Brian? do, Brian and Jake, actually. So one of the storms this winter, one of our local school districts had a, uh, they knew the next day was gonna be a storm day and they did distance learning already during a storm. With all the practice we've had now, um, in the last, well, what would be two months? Is that something that we can set up as, uh, hey, we know what's coming, the storm's coming, kids take your stuff home, tomorrow's gonna be a uh, home work day. Yeah, probably easily. And again, right now there is so much uncertainty as far as how this is gonna pr proceed for the fall. Um, there's discussions floating out there statewide about um, we may be looking at a calendar. We may be looking at instruction that has A days, B days, C days, um, no more than 10 students in a classroom at a given day so that you've got students coming in for one day and then a different group coming in the next day. It's going to be all across the board, Raleigh. And, and the that is a particular statute specifically only based on weather. Whereas this whole distance learning was a complete different one based on the executive order. So it'll be very easy if we want to just create the storm one. Uh, now that we've gone through this, that'll be something that should be easy to work through the summer and just create that and send it over to MDE. Well, I think we should keep it in mind because it would have come in handy. You know, there was a couple of storms that came through that we knew the next day we weren't going to be in school. We knew it. Right. Uh, the kids got out at the normal time. It had been easy enough to say, take your uh, laptops home because tomorrow's going to be a uh, whatever kind of day you want to call it. And, and, you know, going back to at that time, remember that has to be something that you work through with the unions. And we specifically um, had told leadership that this needs to come from the staff. If this is something that they want to do and you had a presentation from, some staff, you know, some levels. But I think the hardest part was gonna be at the elementary level, Raleigh. Because yeah. how do you do some of that with the distance learning at the elementary level? You either are gonna have prepaid packets set up, which was not where we were at at that time. So that's why everything was on hold because it's one thing for people to, to create the packets for two or three weeks of work, but it's another one to have a a standalone packet that you're going to pull out. Maybe you created it back in September, but how is it going to be necessarily pertinent in January or February? You know, where does it go with the flow of what you're doing at the time? So I think that was where some of the struggle was at the elementary level. But uh, I, I think, uh, I believe our, 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 our staff, uh, are probably much more savvy about it now to be able to put something together. And now I'm gonna stop sharing unless you have, unless somebody has <laughs> specific questions about that calendar. I just, no, I, I, I just had one more. Are we, 
you wanted us to get 166 days? 65, 165. You no, know we have to have a minimum of, a, of 165, Raleigh. Um, if we're doing distance learning in the fall, I have a feeling that we're going to be able to take some of those days in May that are after the students leave and have some of those counted in August for the work that's probably going to be going on with students getting a jump start ready. Again, this is all in flux right now. We know that this calendar with these student contact days, because really what you have to do for approval with MDE, it's not the amount of staff days you have. It's simply you have to pass. The board has to create a calendar that meets the minimum requirements for the students. And this calendar does. We can move the student or the staff um, non-instructional days wherever we want them. But it's critical on the student contact days. Anybody else? No, I think that looks good. Let's go ahead. We have a motion by Raleigh, a second by Sandy. Um, let's do a roll call. Uh, Amy? Aye. Laura? Aye. Ronnie? Aye. Sandy? Aye. David? Aye. Raleigh? Oh, Raleigh, you're on mute. Couldn't find the button. Sorry. I <laughs> myself, I motion carries. All right. We're working, moving on to 10.3. Um, this is to uh, revise the schedule for the DGF class of 2020 graduation. Um, I'm going to grab, I'm going to get a motion in a second and then we'll go into, we will have some discussion here. So could I have a motion? I'll make a motion that we move the graduation ceremony to Sunday, May 31st. Got a motion from Sandy. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Amy. All right. I'll open the floor for discussion. I'm. I know Raleigh and I both have something to say, and um, I, I would appreciate other people to chime in as well. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and start, and and just kind of have my opinion here. Uh, you know, we were trying to be proactive last Monday night and, uh, you know, I felt good when we left that meeting and thinking, you know, gosh, we, we really, we're, we've got our poop in a group. But um, unfortunately now, like many parents, uh, including myself, we're extremely frustrated uh, and disappointed in our governor's uh, decision. Uh, here's the deal, though. We're not alone. Uh, there's bordering communities all up and down the state of Minnesota that border North Dakota that are feeling the same ab absolute way that we are. Um, I think that this isn't going to be uh, traditional, unfortunately, um, but we have an opportunity to help our seniors make a memory that will be like no other graduation in history. They will be making history. And I think myself as a parent, I lost sight of that. And after having a frank discussion with my senior Aiden, um, he made it very clear that although he is disappointed, um, you know, I have to move on with my life. And uh, he said, and if doing that means waiting another month and hearing the same disappointment, I don't want to do it twice. Just move the date up, get all my classmates involved, everybody leaving for the military, everybody can be included. So I'm going to listen to my son because my heart hurts more for him than his hurts for himself. So there's my two cents. Hmm. <laughs> uh, my turn. Go ahead, Rolf. Um, yep, go ahead, Rolf. I'm sitting here thinking there's still a lot of time between now and June 26th. We had it set for June 26th. That night we left there, we were all very comfortable saying June 26th, no matter how it turned out. Um, I can tell you that I've been reading uh, and listening to TV and news articles from Minneapolis, and they are getting massacred down there uh, by state representatives, Democrat and Republican, for doing what they did. They are getting hammered left and right. Now, if by the time we change it to uh, May 31st, 
And, you know, May 18th is coming up when the supposed um, stay-at-home orders are over. If things change, I don't think they will. In fact, I think he's going to extend it to June 1, although the the deaths and everything were down today, down to like 19. Um, I, I, I'm i still for the June 26th, and if it ends up being a parade June 26th, it's a parade June 26th, but at least it gives it a shot, a better shot at walking across the stage. I've said my piece. Brian, don't laugh, but now I can sleep at night. <laughs> Anybody else have any, want to share any thoughts? Um, I have a little to add to that. You know, obviously this has not been an easy transition for everybody to go one way and then back to the other. Um, the unknowns are just too many at this point. I have a, a friend, a mutual friend with Lindsay that is a, in a neighboring school district, um, and she's on the school board and she sat in on the Zoom meeting today with the MREA during her lunch hour. And it sounded as though the MREA today said, this is not gonna happen at all for the entire summer. Now, do I feel frustrated? I feel as though the governor and um, they are in the Department of Health is making you know, a decision based off of the metro area versus the rule. I mean, Uland Hinderdahl only has 19 graduates this year. And they're going to have to discuss and figure out what they're going to do as an alternative to the date that they set on June 19th. Um, so just, you know, like I say, I've said this many times, I think we can make this absolutely amazing for our kids. Um, they are making history with their graduation. And, you know, just a little bit of grace and understanding goes a long way. Um, I just want to add in there, because um, I'm, you know, I'm certain that these students that wrote in tonight will... Um, you know, watch and I, I want to tell them how much I do appreciate their comments and uh, it takes a lot of courage to write in and say what you feel and it's not easy. I've done it myself back in 2015 during a referendum and it's not easy. So um, thank them for their time and doing that. I wouldn't be opposed to Wayne. Um, I think you're still on here. Uh, you know, surveying the seniors and asking them for their ideas because I think that between the adults on this call um, and the seniors that we can come up with something pretty darn amazing. And you know what, maybe we build a car ramp and they drive their car up on it. I don't know. They're, they can drive across the stage. I don't know. Probably Brian's shaking his head, probably going, that's the legality of that is awful. Lens. But anyway. Lindsay, I think that's a cool idea, Lindsay. I think you've got, I think we, we have a unique opportunity to get, some meetings, opportunity to get some meetings this week with the seniors and talk about here's what we can do. Now, how do you, here's all the things that we've got available to us, whether it be the parade, whether it be, you know, we get the speeches done in advance, we work with a radio station so that we can have speeches played during, we can make up a, a, a memory CD with all of this stuff, videoing and, and what else not. What other things would you like to see with this? Just knowing that these parameters are set, we can't bring them into the building. We can't, even though we've got the social distancing, you know, we had, a, we had that discussion earlier today administratively about, well, what if we spaced them out and just had one in the gym at a time and it goes right back to they're trying to make it extremely clear that you cannot do where you're bringing multiple households. I love that when they put even in situations where ample space between attendees could be accommodated. They do not want us to be able to do this. And it, 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 it's sad. But, okay, so we know that. Now let's get the kids involved and let's talk about if we've got to have it in the parking lot, what would be some ideas, folks, that you guys think would be cool with this? And let them in on the planning part for that. But we just got to get the date set and then get the kids involved with it. Because we can get the parameters for the parade and all that. That's easy enough working with the city's the municipality. That's all already coming together. Think about how much has, has taken place in the past 72 hours since that lovely announcement. And now it's it's time. Let's let's get the kids going on this. It's their experience. How can we make it unique for the DGF class of 2020 with their brand on it? 
I forgot something that Barnesville's doing, at least is what one of the parents said that came out today for them. Uh, seniors will go to the school in the morning, put on their caps and gowns, and get photographed individually with the school board president receiving a diploma. Now, this goes against everything that you just said about going to the school, Brian. I mean, they're either they're interpreting it different or they're just going to say the hell with it, one of the two. Really, I think it's the difference between it's we can go, and, and this is where that virtual piece comes in. You can have it set up so that individuals are coming in to get photographed. The problem is if you're bringing them all in with their families so that you got multiple households again, all coming in over there to take those pictures and that. So it's, it's the difference between if we want the, the professional photo done, we can set that to be done over the course of multiple days where the kids set up appointments to come in and we get pictures done. Now, we may not be able to get the photographers to do that multiple days, but we could do it internally. So we've had those type of discussions where that could be made up and that could be made into a memory mate. But the actual picking up of the diploma, you know, where you're going to have them all there and parade, whatever you're going to do, they've got to be quarantined completely in the vehicles or you got to do virtual. So in this parade idea that, that we we're out right now, are we just going to have them all show up at the high school parking lot and start the parade there? So we've got 100 cars sitting there. Or how, how are we going to work that? You know, Where's, they can't be. Yep. That's probably what's going to have to happen. Well, and that's the that's the logistics part. You know, you know that we've, we've got to just work through. Are you going to have them in, coming in the back? Do you line them up after they come in? they got a particular number so they know where they are in the order and they come over um, and then they come through the parking lot and then we direct them to get into the following line up and down park or, or whatever. <laughs> Those are the logistics that have to be worked through. And I, I feel very comfortable just knowing who's all involved in this. The fact that you take Jake, Tracy, and, and, and you know, some people that are very good with the detail part. Um, I, that's what we'll be spending the week on is all of those type of logistics. Just one question, Brian. Um, say the governor picks June 1st as the stay. He lifts the stay at home order. What if he extends it? And then we're stuck, you know, then we're stuck having this conversation again. Do we want to select a backup? If he did that, I hope well, he doesn't. Well, here's the thing. They, and, and I'm just going to be, I want to show you that again. Just. I'm just saying like to June 5th, like May 31st, Friday, June 5th. I don't think it's going to matter. It's, this is a complete separate component. For them to put this out Friday morning on the graduation commencement celebration guidance, it's not going to matter what the stay at home is for businesses and what else not. This is about what the public schools can do. They wouldn't have put that out on Friday unless, and you notice that paragraph there, we know that until later in the summer to allow for more traditional event. Well, we recognize that desire to honor this rite of passage in a more traditional way. We cannot offer a timeline. So it's not going to have anything to do with just those stay-at-home orders. This is all about the public celebrations of the public, of, of the public schools. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ronnie, did, were you wanting to talk? I thought I saw, did you raise your hand? I did. Uh... Well, I guess the first thing, and I'm sure everybody else totally agrees, I'm just truly disappointed in MDE. There's no reason this couldn't have been put out two weeks ago, so we had time to do it. That's the big frustration, but we got to live with it and do what we can. Uh, you know, we took the June date to try to go far enough down the line so that we could have an outdoor one, and basically that's out the window. So what do you do? And I guess moving it back up, you know, gets all of them in there, even those in the military that's going to go out. So that would help for that standpoint. I thought I heard some of the comments there that were read tonight that, you know, I guess I didn't really hear anybody say they wanted to do virtual. Uh, you know, a lot of them tried to do, you know, do whatever you can or whatever. And I thought there's even a couple of them that said, well, maybe even winter, you could turn around and have a 
traditional one too if you wanted to i don't know but i don't really think that they're going to release stuff through the summer so you know there's just nothing going to go on that i know of so i guess i think we got to try the may 31st one anybody else sandy did you have any comment um no i just i know that there's a motion and a second on the floor for that one date yep everybody else good Oh, uh, Amy, you're waving at me. Are you good? No, David wanted to talk. Oh, David, I'm sorry. It's not flashing up anymore. So you guys just got to leave at me. Your hand raising didn't go. No worries. Um, I just, regardless of whether shelter in place is, you know, removed for the state, I think the bigger issue probably is um, the amount of people can congregate together. So even if we have shelter in place removed, I do not see them encouraging groups of uh, over, I mean, right now it's 10 people. Um, you're talking about graduation, you're talking about hundreds. I just, I don't see that happening. So I guess that's, I mean, it's unfortunate. I agree with everyone here. It's, this stinks. And I, but it is what it is and it's out of our control. I'm just wondering how anybody else feels if it is moved to May 31st. Is, do you feel that's an that's ample time for getting it organized? Wayne, do you want to comment on that? Wayne or Tracy, whoever. You need to get that sound button working again. Um, yeah, I think so. I think we are the major legwork is going to be the next few days. Um, some of it, I think, logistically, uh, uh, with the law enforcement, you know, some of that with the parking that was brought up earlier. Um, I talked to a couple county deputies and they had mentioned probably possibly congregating out on a county road just outside of Glendon, maybe uh, like 17 or something like that, rather than in town in one one spot, for example just different ideas that are probably out there. Um, as far as the ceremony, I, I, I mean, I've got some ideas. We've talked about some things there and I've talked to some other principals. I've got some general ideas for that. I know I really, I like the idea of having the students involved, um, get, at least giving them an opportunity to, to share what they would like to see or, or participate somehow in it. Um, but I think by the end of the week, we could have something put together. Okay. Do we have our speakers um, set, Wayne, for what would be a traditional service? Do you have those kids picked? I have them picked and they've been talked to, but they haven't been talked to as far as being three weeks from now. <laughs> so we'll have to get going on that. Okay. Right away. Okay. All right. We got a motion and we have a, oh, where's my paper? We have a motion and we have a second. Uh, let's go ahead. Roll call. Um, Amy. Aye. Laura. Aye. Sandy. Aye. Uh, David. Aye. Raleigh. Oh, Ronnie. Aye. Raleigh. Dang, speaker button. No. And myself, I motion carries six one. All right, graduation will be moved back to May thirty first. Um, communication should go out to the district um, residents as soon as reasonably possible. Tomorrow. And a oh. and a survey out to the senior class. Yep, survey out to the senior class. Um, so as Brian said, uh, operations will not be meeting tonight. He will be reaching out to Amy Raleigh and Ronnie in regards to possibly having a meeting next Monday night. So look for an email or actually, um, Brian, can you just maybe text and let Ronnie know so he can see if he's in the tractor or even Raleigh too. He's been doing some stuff and get that coordinated. We will be having our next meeting on Tuesday, May 26th. This will be virtual as well. We're going to start with the fiscal personnel at 5, so I will see David and Sandy there, followed by the board meeting on Tuesday, May 26th at 6. Lindsay? Oh, 
Yep. I'm, I'm wondering if the personnel meeting can follow the regular board meeting on that Tuesday, uh, because I would be at work. I'm assuming I'm going to be called back. I'll be at work okay. until five, and I just don't have access to get internet and out of the building before. Oh, yeah, no, uh, that's fine with me, David. Brian, yep. is that fine with you? Yeah, the other thing we could do is, you know, potentially if we wanted to go back to back, um, assuming that we've got the information that we need with the capital and some of this stuff, um, I could go back to back meetings next Monday because, again, part of the what I want to get information to these groups is a lot of it's associated with the capital. And we know that we'll have the oversight committee meeting done. So, the, you know, we could potentially next Monday go a six o'clock for one group and a seven o'clock from the other, assuming we've got the updates that we need from Thursday's conference call with the commissioner. And I can just get a hold of all of you to see it. In general, would that work for you guys if we did a six o'clock and a seven o'clock back to back? Because then during the week, then I can be sharing all the updates. Here's what's the latest on the Capitol based on Earth to five, six to 12 and all that but I can at least review all that with everybody. And here's the costs. And by the way, here's what we spent on capital this past year. And here's what we may want to look at cutting down to on capital for this year because of the unknowns. Sure. Okay. So Brian will send out an invite to those on the fiscal personnel and those to operation for next Monday night. Uh, note our next meeting is on a Tuesday night, Tuesday the 26th, so everybody is aware of that. There will be no fiscal personnel before that. We'll just have our next boarding, board meeting, Tuesday, May 26th, virtually at 6 p.m., Tuesday. We're all good. All right, everybody have a nice evening. Oh, hi, Poppy, good to see you. Laura almost made it, it's 7.36. <laughs>